Well, I'm here with uh, Real Rock Dector and Sebastian Pardo and the producers and directors of The Computer Accidents. This is a very interesting documentary. Uh, it's seen a lot of music doc music documentaries, but none quite like this. As you guys get into the AI, which I, actually after watching the documentary, it seems AI seems almost like a misnomer because uh, you think of AI, um, you think of it in science fiction terms that uh, it's this computer that sits around just waiting to write music, and that's not exactly what happens here. Uh, what, what what brought you into the the project and just kind of what's your uh, background as far as AI or how much you knew going in, how much you found out throughout the process of making the documentary? Yeah, I think like to go off what you're saying, I think we had a similar, maybe not that it's just in a room waiting to write music, but I think when you hear that word, it's so loaded that you think of um, kind of, yeah, this other this other thing outside of us that is going to you know, create something truly new and novel and wonderful uh, or odd, right? And um, I think that was what was so intriguing to us and what brought us into the project was that this band wanted to do it. And I think we were curious enough about what was going on in the in the artificial intelligence space without really understanding it all that well. And this seemed like the perfect path in for us as filmmakers to learn about it. And in doing so, kind of like allow the film to go on the same path and teach people um about what's really going on in AI was there any uh because as, as I'm watching this you know they're uh, basically the band yacht they're they're making an album uh with the assistance of the AI um and then I'm wondering I wonder if they uh decided ever thought of using AI to make the documentary and just get completely meta with it <laughs> I mean we certainly talked about uh using AI to do like an editing software and that sort of thing. Um, we didn't quite go in that direction. I think it would have been too many hats on a hat maybe. Uh, <laughs> but Maybe for uh, an alternate cut that was unwatchable. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we were, there were some frustrating moments in the edit where we're like, well, why? We could just, you know, give it to a machine. <laughs> but I mean, we, I guess, we powered through, you know. I, I guess in kind of a way, because there's a lot of crossover with uh, what Yacht was doing. And what you guys do specifically as documentary filmmakers, uh, because mm -hmm. like, you know, in a air quote traditional movie, you make the sets, you write the characters, uh, do the costumes and so on. So you're like involved in the the creation of what you're shooting. But as documentary filmmakers, it's it's uh, seems to be a lot of crossover with the way Yacht did it and that you just kind of... Um, you get what you get and then just kind of put it together uh, as truthfully as you can. Good. Yeah, Thanks for sure. I mean, um, I think this film posed a lot of challenges in the sense that so much of the action is happening in a computer and it's just little bits moving around. And so for us, the challenge was um, where are the moments that we can be verite and follow them around and really try to capture some of what it feels like to work this way. And uh, what can we create to communicate ideas that are fairly abstract and turn them into, you know, hopefully a compelling um, representation, you know, demonstration, representation, information uh, dump of, of how this stuff actually works. What, what's yeah. your guys' uh, feelings on uh, just documentaries in general? They, you know, they say ideally you know documentaries are supposed to be the truth but there's a saying every cut is a lie so like what's your uh kind of take and approach on just documentaries i mean <laughs> we've we've kind of made our bread and butter and examining that, that exact question we, we also have produced quite a bit of movies that uh cut to the heart of the 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 fact that a camera is even in the room or the fact that the filmmaker has agency over what you see all those things are manipulations the idea that it's just pure unadulterated truth is is a is a fiction and it can be a, a dangerous fiction that people use to to create films that um can inform air quotes uh through deceit in a way whether it's well-meaning or not um and that is um i think especially now in, in a, where everybody kind of has access to a camera in their pocket and is constantly posting videos of themselves people are getting a lot more sophisticated at parsing well, what is a creation? What does somebody want me to see? And what is really there? And I think um, that is an experience that used to be only held by a very rare 
few amount of filmmakers creating films, you know, out out with a you know 35 millimeter camera and whatever. But now it's kind of an experience that almost everybody has real experience with. Yeah, so I think, I think nonfiction. It, well, go ahead, real. Well, I was just going to say I think AI adds a whole other layer to that. So, uh, you know, the the we explore obviously you know the threat of AI to like music and the creative creative arts but you know ai can also has evolved in such a way even while making this film that you know it like sounds you know is this really an elvis presley song or is this some song that was generated in ai that's happening to images you know you now have images of people that are totally fabricated and uh you know now so so you have the ability in nonfiction uh to change you know uh oh it was a sunny day let's make it a winter day like the, mm -hmm. the technology is getting to that point now where and we, we're not really educating people in in those changes so the level of uh image trusting i guess uh yeah the veracity of images has has decayed like the example i always use was you know if you brought a early film camera to 1880s uh you know tombstone arizona and you took a double exposure you could convince people that ghosts were real because they had no literacy to understand how a camera worked. And I think like we all saying, we're entering that space now where people are not educated as to what, or they just haven't seen it enough to know what AI can do. And you can actually really start to co convince people um, that certain things are true that aren't. And um, that's kind of a, a brave new world in a way. Do you think, uh, uh, how do I ask the question? Do you think uh, we're far off from doing the actual AI to where like the computer is just sitting there and it's like, you know what, I want to make an album now. And then just an album pops out because that that would probably be the Turing test, I think, not putting the information out and having the computer spit it back out at you, but the computer just wanting to do it on its own. Absolutely. I think that is the big philosophical question that kicked off this whole project and and Google's own projects and all these all the investment that goes into it. Um, if a machine could actually have insight on what it means to be alive and create something relevant and meaningful that we would consider art, uh, you would have to consider it conscious. You would have to consider it, um, uh, yeah, that'd be a scary thing. But the, the other fork of that is, um, could a, an uh, AI make something for its own pleasure and enjoyment, and what would that sound like? And that's a whole other bag of worms in the sense that then it's creating something meaningful about its experience of, of being, quote, alive or sentient or conscious. Um, and that would also have a tremendous amount of implications. But I think take, bringing that idea into the, the film, as, as we kind of did to some degree, and then realizing, oh, um, it's basically just that monkey see, monkey do kind of levels of competency right now. You realize kind of how far it is. And, and I think that's also a philosophical, almost faith supposition that that's even possible. Can we actually create enough bits to replicate something we know almost nothing about? Um, we don't really know about that much about consciousness. Um, if we're to say that it's about neurons firing, uh, we only, I think within the last year, fully mapped the neurons of a fruit fly, which has 15,000 neuron sites. The human brain has 3 billion. So what is consciousness? Where is it? How do we do it? It's across so many disciplines that so many breakthroughs would have to happen that I think we're actually very, very far from it. But we're not far from maybe dangerous things happening with AI. Uh, not, not, right. not saying that it's imminent, but it's not nearly, it doesn't have to be conscious to, to make problems, I guess is what I mean by that. Right. I wonder if, uh, because kind of what you're saying with uh, how dangerous it is, I always get a uh, Harlan Ellison's I have no mouth and I must scream in my head. And I'm like, last thing <laughs> I need is am just put me at the bottom of the world and torturing me forever. Yeah. But I wonder, I wonder how much of that is just um, us putting ourselves into what AI is possible of. Like, this is what we would do. So clearly that's what the, what the computer is going to do, which totally. I, what does that say about us? <laughs> Not you guys, but I mean, us as, uh, sure. as a uh, humanity. Well, I think the whole thing is about it being a mirror, right? Like we, we consider AI to be this thing that's outside of us, that's, you know, autonomous from us, but it is, you know, as Ken Kenrick says in the film, it's like the, the accumulation of all of our knowledge and ability and uh, discoveries is what, you know, AI is, is the end result. So it is, it is actually just a, a reflection of us. So 
how good are we and like what decisions are we going to make with it you know um i think is the bigger question than is it going to have thoughts of, of its own like whatever thoughts it has are thoughts that we've put in there in some way or another you know and do you think the uh the well uh, this, this is just a wildly stupid question we're gonna ask, <laughs> ask it anyway but the uh that there's a part where they uh got you know prints out they got like hundreds of sheets of paper of all the lyrics sure and yeah. they didn't use all of it and i'm wondering if they i was like hey you're censoring my words man <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't even know their words yeah well, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> yeah. it doesn't even know it's a language it it's could just, just be numbers for all it's concerned yeah 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 well, um, i mean they do say this in the film like they could give that same pile of lyrics to you know a different band and they would come up with a totally different thing so really it is at the level that it was at in the application of it it really was just um materials for them to kind of pick and choose from to create something new out of you know? yeah and that, i mean i think that goes back to the mirror point they saw in it what they found beautiful yeah yeah wow i did not get high enough for this <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I do kind of want to end on, uh, so the production company you guys work for is Memory. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks like uh, Ariel, your project director, and uh, Sebastian, you're the uh, creative director. Um, what can you tell us about Memory and like how, because um, you have a bunch of movies on here that I'm just like, oh, God, I need to go. I should have watched all 3,000 <laughs> of these. But uh, <laughs> what's the uh, story behind that? And, you know, says that you guys like curate, like what goes into the process of finding what movies you want to produce and uh, add to that mm -hmm. sort of a whole. I mean, I think some of your questions about nonfiction are actually really relevant to that in the sense that, you know, we've started to realize that some of the most vital questions being asked in, in cinema are around that issue. Um, everybody's pretty aware of that when it comes to, you know, auteur theory and creating narrative movies, that this is the vision of an individual and so on and so forth, but somewhat less literate in that when it comes to nonfiction. So a lot of our films investigate, like I was saying, that that question or subvert it or tweak it um, and provoke the audience into really questioning what they're seeing and wrestling with the image. And so for the last eight years, um, we've run this production company um, really looking for new voices that are willing to be uncompromising ar around their work and are, are willing to kind of work outside of the mainstream and are about the work. They're not necessarily looking at it as a multi-step process to get to um, being considered for a Marvel movie or anything like that. They just have an expression within them. It's, it's much closer to an art practice. It's, it's an expression within them and the ways that they're wrestling with the world that they see around them are through creating this work that um, is trying to be honest, but is also rec you know, reconciling what it means to be honest when you are this puppet master behind the strings, pulling all the strings, uh, behind the scenes, pulling all the strings. Um, and I think uh, the curation, you know, we can only, we're two people and, you know, with a couple help, with some help and uh, there's only so many films we can make. And so I think the, the curation and signal boosting of filmmakers who fit that ethos and who make films that we um, we really like, we we put our energy into into supporting and and um, yeah that is that yeah go ahead real yeah I mean I think we you know spent uh, that period of time really like fostering new voices and new artists who come to us uh, and and like the work that we do and I think that part of the signal boosting is like planting our flag and saying hey this is the kind of work we want to produce and promote and so we've met a lot of filmmakers and worked with them on their first film and there's now their second film and I think um, you know whenever they approach us uh, with ideas or like things that kind of push the envelope or push boundaries or, or things that we've never seen before we tend to get excited and, and want to get behind that and I think that's similarly what happened with the computer accent is instead of meeting direct a director or an artist with an idea, we met a group of artists, a group of musicians who wanted to do something that we'd never seen done or heard anyone having done before. And that made us want to kind of go on that journey with them. And it's sort of how we ended up in the director's chair as opposed to the producer chair, which we're often, more often in. Um, because, you know, as a group of artists, they were, they were 
essentially like we could all work together and kind of direct and create this and produce this film. So it is uh, in a way a culmination of all the things we've done up until this this moment. All right. Well, uh, Sebastian, Riel, thank you for uh, taking your time. And I really enjoyed the documentary and uh, can't wait to see the uh, memory produced AI documentary probably coming up <laughs> in the, within the next 10 years. Absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, the Yeah, thanks for your time.